Hello everyone, this is Mike Howard and I am here with Bev Howard. And we're gonna do a Bible study. We're in our last lesson or last session in the Explore the Bible series for winter. Thankfully winter's Yay. almost over. Next week we will begin a study of first and second Thessalonians. I'm excited about that. But I am so excited about today's lesson. Yay. It is the chapter 9 of the book of Daniel, our last lesson in Daniel. And this is a prayer that Daniel prays just before the end of the exile. And it is a, a model prayer. Mm. We, we know in the New Testament, we've got the Lord's Prayer, where the Lord Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray. Right. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of prayers recorded in the Bible. But this one is Daniel's prayer is... It's put up there um, in a similar place as the Lord's Prayer in terms of, of it being a model prayer for, uh, for all of us to pray. As a matter of fact, Ann Graham Lotz has got a book called The Daniel Prayer that Bev used for a Bible study not too long ago, and it is about this prayer. And she does an excellent job of taking us through the prayer. We don't have that much time today, so I'm going to kind of hit the highlights and we'll get through it in a few minutes. So the name of the session is Confession Made. And confession is a big part of Daniel's prayer. And you'll understand why when we get into it. Now, what does confession mean? Well, it means in, in the Greek especially, it means to say the same thing. So uh, for us as Christians, when we confess, it means to, we agree with God about something in our lives. It's to admit, it's to acknowledge. And in the Hebrew, the word really means to come to God with your hands open, meaning that you have nothing uh, of your own to bring to him. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> that is our confession, and that's the definition of confession. So what did Daniel know about the exile? So you remember he was taken as a teenager from Jerusalem into exile in Babylon, and now he is an old man. He's probably close to 70, 80 years old. And so he's about to pray a prayer that will come at the end of what he hopes to be the end of the exile. So he is, he's assuming that the exile is about to end. Now, what did he know about the exile? Well, he, he knew, of course, from his personal experience about the exile, but he also knew that Moses predicted the exile 600 years earlier in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and Deuteronomy chapter 30. He also knows, because he had the scriptures of Jeremiah, that the, the, uh, God had told Jeremiah to tell the exiles that this was only going to last for 70 years. And we assume he also had the scrolls of Isaiah who predicted, and Isaiah lived about 100 years prior to Daniel. Isaiah predicted 100 years earlier that there would be a king, and his name would be Cyrus, and this king Cyrus would issue the command to rebuild the temple and Jerusalem. And I find that to be utterly outstanding yes. that, 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 uh, that he, he would do that. Yeah, even No, he called him by name in, in the, in the uh, scripture. So the background of this comes in, to us in, in uh, verse 2 of chapter 9, because our, our uh, uh, focal verses don't start until verse 4, but verse 2 tells us really what's going on. He says, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, and we assume that he means uh, not only the Jeremiah scripture about the 70 years, but also he understood the Moses prediction, and he also understood what Isaiah was saying about Cyrus. So how excited would he be when a new king takes over and the new king's name is Cyrus and he goes, bing, 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 I know that name and he's going to issue a decree and it all came to pass. So he understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last for 70 years. Now, what Daniel did not know was when did God start the clock? Did he start the clock at the very beginning of the exile, which would have been about 608 BC? Or did he start the clock when the temple and the uh, city walls were destroyed, which would have been 581? Remember, the, the, uh, the exile came in three uh, waves or three iterations. And so Daniel, will, he wasn't real sure which one of those times God was gonna use to start the 70 year clock. So it could be anywhere from 538, by the way, this prayer happens in 539, which is one year prior to the decree from Cyrus. 
So he didn't know if it would start soon, as in the next year, or if it would be a few years from that time, but he knew it was almost over based on the promise that God had given to Jeremiah. So then in verse three, he said, so I turned to the Lord and I pleaded with him in prayer, in petition, in fasting, in sackcloth and in ashes. In other words, he knew, he, Daniel, knew that this exile was almost over and he wanted to make his case to God about why that was a good idea to go ahead and end the exile. And so he really had all his ducks in a row, so to speak, and he was going to bring those petitions to the Lord and he was going to focus really hard on getting this right. And that's why it's such a beautiful prayer. So chapter nine, confession made. Let's get started. He first of all tells God that he is a great God. So the first thing we need to do in our prayers is to recognize that we're praying to the most almighty, wonderful, awesome God who created the universe. And that's who we are petitioning. We're not just talking to a friend. We're talking to a friend who is also the creator God of the universe. Daniel 9 verses 4 through, 4, 4 through 19. I prayed, I, Daniel, prayed to the Lord my God and I confessed. He says, Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love. And this is going to be an important part of the prayer. So we need to mark these words. He says, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Because he's about to confess that they have not done their part of this covenant. So, and I want to remember this when we get to the end as well. <clears throat> Verse five. So he's going to confess not only uh, for himself and his own sins, but he's going to confess for the sins of the entire nation of Judah uh, and for all Israelites, all of God's people. He says, we have sinned and done wrong. We have. Now he's talking past tense here. So I want us to keep an idea, uh, an eye on the, uh, on the tense of his confession, his past tense, present tense, and he's going to talk a little bit about future we have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and, his law, and your laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our leaders, our princes, our ancestors, and to all the people of the land. In other words, the prophets have told everybody, our leaders and the rest of us, what's going to happen if we disobey. So Lord, you are righteous. But this day we are covered in shame. 70 years into this exile and we are so ashamed of what we've done. The people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all of Israel, both near and far and all the countries where you have scattered us because we have been unfaithful to you. So we and our kings, our princes, our ancestors are covered with shame, Lord. So he makes that confession that we recognize that we have been rebellious. Because we've sinned against you, the Lord our God, however, is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. So he's going to make a plea, and he's going to lean on the mercy of God here in his prayer. And we can do that too. Yes. He says, even though we have not obeyed the Lord our God or kept the laws that he gave us through his servants, the prophets, all of Israel has transgressed your law and turned away. We've refused to obey you. Therefore, the curses, these are the curses that, that Moses outlined in, uh, in Deuteronomy 4 and 30. said, therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of the Lord, have been poured out on us. In other words, you warned us ahead of time that if we didn't obey, if we didn't keep your law, if we weren't faithful to you, if we didn't love you and you alone, if we turned to other gods, you warned us what would happen. And in fact, it did happen. They've been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. You really, he's saying, he's making the case, he's saying, we clearly understand why this has happened to us. And we understand that because of your righteousness, you were forced to, re yeah, to mm -hmm. judge us. He says, you have fulfilled the words spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing upon us this great disaster and under the whole of heaven, now he's going to describe the disaster. He says, under the whole of heaven, nothing has ever been done like what has been done to Jerusalem. All right, and he's going to make this point in the prayer. And this is something the Holy Spirit told him to pray because wait till we get to the end of the lesson and I'll explain to you 
why this verse right here, this part of verse 12, has absolutely come to pass under the whole heaven, under all of creation, from beginning of time, nothing has ever been done like what has been done to Jerusalem. Now, we think when, when he's praying this prayer, we think, Daniel, you're being a little dramatic, okay? The walls were torn down, the temple was torn down, but you're being a little dramatic to say that nothing under heaven has ever been done like what has been done to Jerusalem. But he wasn't being overdramatic. He was actually being a prophet, and I'll explain later. Verse 13, the punishment has been terrible, just as it was written in the law of Moses, and that's Deuteronomy 4 and 30. All of this disaster has come upon us, yet, and he's switching now. Okay, he's going to go from we've, we've violated all these things. We've, we've violated your law. We've sinned against you. We've rebelled against you, past tense. And now he's going to shift gears into present tense. And he says here, yet even to this very day, even right now, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our sins. In other words, we have sinned past tense, but, but God, look at us. We're still doing that. We're still worshiping wooden idols. We're still rebelling against you. He says, by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth, the Lord then did not hesitate to bring the disaster on us for the Lord our God is righteous in everything that he does. And yet we still do not turn back to him. Okay, so Daniel is desperate here. He says, I know that we deserve everything that we've gotten. And quite frankly, God, we really, we're ashamed of it, but we haven't changed our ways. Verse 15, but now he's going to shift gears here and he's, he's actually going to make a plea to the Lord. He says, but not for our sake. I, I want you to end this exile. I want you to take this exile away. I want you to restore us to Jerusalem. I want you to let us go back to your promised land. I want, us, I want you to uh, let this judgment end. Okay, he's saying he's making this plea, but he says, I, I want you to do it not because of us, but because of you. So he says, now, Lord, our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand and who made for yourself a name that endures to this day, we have sinned. We have done wrong. We continue to do wrong. But Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, I want you, please, to turn away your anger, your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. You told Jeremiah that it would last 70 years. It doesn't look like we've really changed our ways, but I want you, I'm pleading for you to simply end this exile and let us return to Jerusalem. Our sins and the iniquities of our ancestors have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all of those around us. Now, our God, I want you to hear the prayers and the petitions of your servant. For your sake, Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. And it's, what he's saying here is, God, you are a great God, and we are your people, and we're not really good at being your people, but for your name's sake, for your sake, for the sake of your city that is your holy hill, I beg you to end this exile. He said, look with favor on us, this desolate sanctuary. Give ear, our God, and hear. I want you to open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous. And this is another good prayer. Uh, this is a prayer where we as Christians fall back on the, the, on the cross, on Jesus' mm -hmm. sacrifice. And every day we confess our sins and we say, not because we're righteous, God, but because of your great mercy on us. He said, Lord, and this, he's wrapping it up here. He says, Lord, I want you to listen. Please, Lord, forgive. Lord, hear. Just please act. For your sake, my God, do not delay because your city and your people bear your name. So he's making this plea with the full understanding that God has every right to keep them in exile because quite frankly, they have not changed their stripes or their ways. They are still a rebellious people. But God did promise Jeremiah that he would end this exile in 70 years. And the number seven is going to be important to the lesson. So seven is the, the number for completeness. That's, that's when God completed the creation of the universe, okay? So seven is a, a number that indicates perfection. So he's saying, okay, the completeness of our exile is 70 years. So God, now you've told Jeremiah that you're going to allow us to return back. And now there's a king named Cyrus. And, he, and Isaiah said that's going to happen. So he's all excited about it. 
So let's summarize. So let's take a look at the beauty. And it is a beautiful, beautiful prayer. The beauty of Daniel's prayer. First thing he did was he agreed with God about Judah's sin. And that's where we all have to start. We all have to tell God. Uh, and that's how you become a Christian is you just turn to God and you say, God, I have rebelled. I have sinned. I've done wrong things in my life. And I know that I have. I'm not perfect. And I know that you are a perfect God. So the first step in coming to God is to acknowledge and to confess your sin. And that's what he does. And then he says, I acknowledge that you are within your rights. You are perfectly justified in the punishment that you have decreed to us. I've heard a lot of people say that, well, hell sounds a little harsh. And what Daniel says here is, I fully understand. You are a righteous God. We're a sinful people. I got it. I understand you cannot have fellowship because you are a perfectly righteous God. And then he pleads to God to have mercy and to forgive their sin and rebellion. And he urges God to glorify his name, his city, and his people. So he says to God, he says, he said, I want you, the ultimate response to this prayer, the, where, where Daniel lands on this prayer is, oh God, you, 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 you deserve to be glorified. You deserve a people who are obedient. You deserve to have a holy presence and a holy hill. You created this universe and you deserve to have it to be precious and sinless in your sight. You deserve all of those things. So God, I am praying that you will make that happen. I'm praying that you will bring that to pass. It's a beautiful prayer. And he says, but in order to do it, you're going to have to forgive us of our sin. Daniel's prayer was for not just this exile. And this is the part that blows your mind. This is the part that makes you look at it and go, wow. Because Daniel was praying at the very end of a 70-year exile, but this prayer really, quite frankly, wasn't about that exile. It was about a much bigger exile. It was about our exile from the presence of God. It was about Adam and Eve getting kicked out of the Garden of Eden. It was about our exile from God's presence. That's the exile that Daniel's prayer is, is to address. Now, Daniel did not really understand that. Daniel thought he was praying specifically for the exile, which was really nothing but an example. The, the exile of Judah from Jerusalem was nothing but an example of our exile from the presence of God as a people. And Daniel was praying this specifically for that exile, but God really understood it and God really inspired it to be a prayer that we can pray for the great exile, the big exile, the exile of all of us being exiled from God's presence because of our sinful condition. Now, how do I say that? The Jews and all the people would continue to rebel in their sin and rebellion. So remember, he starts out with, we have sinned against you in the past. And then he goes on to say, and unfortunately, we continue to sin against you today. And what he didn't say was, but what we all know, thousands of years later, we continue to sin because we have a sinful nature. A righteous God, he says, can't have fellowship with people who continue to rebel. And he can't. That's just because he can't tolerate being around sin. And then he basically says, somebody has got to solve this problem. It's, gonna, it's been in the past. We've never been able to keep your law. It's been in the present. We're not keeping it now. And when he looks ahead, he says, there's just no way that we're going to keep it and be good enough to be in your presence. So he says, somebody has got to come along and solve this problem. At the bottom line, and this is what Moses said in Deuteronomy 30, mm -hmm. the only way that you're going to come back is if your heart needs to be changed. And only then will this prayer of Daniel's be answered. Will it succeed? So the good news for us is, even though it's not part of the focal scriptures, we actually get to hear God's answer to Daniel's prayer. That is the coolest thing. His answer goes something like this. 
Daniel, you and your people were exiled for 70 years. But that 70 years simply represents the complete number, amount of time until the exile is over. And 70 is just an interesting number. But I'm telling you, Daniel, as an answer to your prayer, because you prayed that I would end the exile, and I'm telling you, I'm going to end not only this exile, but I'm going to end the great exile. But it's not going to happen soon. It's going to happen in 490 years. And it's almost exactly, as far as we can calculate, exactly to the day that Jesus entered Jerusalem wow. on the donkey. Wow. He says, this is, uh, by the way, this is Gabriel bringing this answer. He says, as soon as you started to pray, I was told to come deliver this message. And this is the message. Daniel, not just 70 years, but 70 times seven years or 490 years are decreed for your people and your holy city, city to finish transgression. So yes, this exile, this little exile is going to be over very soon, but the exile of all humanity is not going to end for 490 years because that's when you're, you need to finish the transgression. Remember, my people have sinned, our, we have sinned against you in the past. We continue to sin against you now, and we will continue to sin against you in the future unless somebody fixes the problem. And he says, in order to finish, completely eliminate this, tra this rebellion, finish transgression to put an end to sin. Catch this. This is beautiful. To put an end to sin, to completely atone for wickedness, to bring an everlasting righteousness to completely seal up the vision and the prophecy and to anoint the most holy place. In other words, I'm going to end the whole exile, not just the Judean exile, but the exile of all mankind. I am going to make that exile end. That's amazing. And I want you, he says, verse 25, know and understand this from the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until... Now catch this. He talks about uh, one seven. Okay, so that would be seven uh, seven seven. Uh, that would be forty two years. That's how long it took to rebuild the temple and the walls. Okay, he says, uh, rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes. There will be seven sevens. That's forty nine years. The temple and the walls under Ezra, Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra rebuilt the temple, and Nehemiah came and rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. So so that's going to take forty nine years from the time. Cyrus says go until the time they got it finished. Then he says there will be 62 more sevens, okay? But, and then when that happens, the anointed one, the Messiah, will be put to death. If you've ever wondered if the Old Testament talks about the Messiah being put to death, this is a specific verse where it talks about Jesus being put to death. And he says he will have nothing. Now, we're not sure what that means, but clearly Jesus was put to death. Gabriel brings the answer in verse 26. He says, then he says, after that, and we know that 40 years after Jesus was crucified, Titus, who was the leader of the Roman army, came and destroyed Jerusalem again in AD 70. And then uh, Gabriel says, and that's not all. There will always be more wars in and around Jerusalem until the end and until the desolations have been decreed. And then he says in chapter 12, verses 1 to 2, at the end of that, after the Antichrist is going to come, the little horn, and the end will come, and God's people then will be resurrected and will be glorified, not just partially, but completely. So the Messiah must come and he will die. And he told exactly what year he was going to come, 500 years before he came, and then he was going to be crucified. And then he says, there will be always wars in Jerusalem. So you think this exile was bad, Daniel. There will be other exiles. And it starts 40 years after the Messiah is killed. 
So in verse 27b, after three and a half years, this Antichrist is going to set up an abomination that's going to result in God saying, I've had enough in the total destruction of the Antichrist. And then some are going to be returned to glory, and that will be those of us in the church, those of believers, and the rest, those who have faith, and those, uh, the rest of those will go to eternal punishment. And according to Daniel, that will be well-deserved. So what has happened since Daniel prayed this prayer? 70 times 7, 490 years later, Jesus of Nazareth entered Jerusalem, was rejected, and then killed on the cross. 40 years later, the Jews rebelled, and Titus destroyed the temple and the city. Since then, there have been continuous wars, and we as Christians wait. Whether we're alive when he comes or whether we're in our graves, we await for the final Antichrist to come, and we wait for the return of our Messiah. You can't see this, but I want to explain this to you. This is the time of Daniel, this period right here. And this is the, the, from 1500 BC to present time, okay, uh, on the, this chart here. And the colors of these little dots are the religions that have occupied Jerusalem. The point is this, since the beginning, there has always been war in Jerusalem. Jerusalem has been destroyed completely twice, besieged 23 times, attacked 52 times, and captured and recaptured 44 times. This exile was just one of those times. But that 70 years explains all of this. And it is the total and complete exile of mankind from the presence of God. And that will continue until Jesus returns and sets up Jerusalem as his earthly kingdom. And then this will stop. What should we do? All right, now bring us forward thousands of years. We've read Daniel's prayer. We understand that it's a model prayer. We were amazed at how accurate the prediction was for Jesus. But what does that tell us about our prayers and the answer is that we are already redeemed. We have a new heart because of our faith in Christ and our minds are being renewed on a daily basis. But just like Daniel, we do need to confess our sins and obey the spirit that lives within us. Jesus' death and his resurrection defeated sin, defeated Satan, defeated the grave. Therefore, we need to glorify him with our lives. That is our duty. Daniel prayed a most beautiful prayer, and it was about an exile that was a 70-year exile. But the prayer really wasn't just about that exile. It was about our exile from the presence and fellowship with a loving, merciful, gracious God who took our sinful condition and put it on his son so that we could have a new heart and a new mind. Now, our job is to live like we've got one. That's a simple job, isn't it? And tell others that they can have what we have mm -hmm. simply by confessing their sin and placing their faith in the Son of God who died for us. Pray with me. Father God, thank you for Daniel's prayer. Thank you for inspiring him to pray it. Thank you for the exile that was 70 years that simply represents our condition because of our rebellion against you. Now, Father, you have sent your son because you so loved us so that we could have victory over that rebellious condition. So, Father, we love and worship and adore you as the great and mighty God who is now our Holy Father because we've been restored to fellowship with you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, that was Daniel. What a great book. I so thoroughly enjoyed it. Get ready for Thessalonians. We're going to start next week. Until then, be safe and stay healthy. Take care. We love Bye. you. Bye-bye.